The dog is looking at me like, what is happening? What, what could possibly be going on? Hey, everyone. Hi. It's time for disorganized play. That's what's going on. You would think Luigi would be well-versed having witnessed many of these webcam sessions of Dungeons & Dragons genius, and yet <clears throat> a lack of object persistence somehow has impeded his ability to recognize the true greatness which is now being beamed directly into your eyeballs. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Tom Lommel. I am your host today. We're not in the studio. Dom is trying to catch up on some stuff from TwitchCon. And so therefore we are here in my lovely abode where I have rather reluctantly turned the air conditioning off so that we can enjoy a distraction-free stream of uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Yes, Mr. Luigi is definitely missing some french fries here today, although we did give him some treats earlier. No Luigi cam today, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, maybe on Thursday, we're going to have a special episode of Disorganized Play. We'll have Luigi cam on as well. So... It is 101 degrees today in Los Angeles. Let me check. That was, the, I think that's the downtown temperature. Here in, here in lovely North Hollywood, California. Oh, yep, it's holding steady at 100 degrees. Pretty great. <clears throat> We're having a Santa, Santa Ana, which means that a awful wind blows down through the mountains and just fills Los Angeles with dust. So, it is horrible, horrible. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, there we go. That's the, uh, that's the weather report. Yeah, it's beautiful you know, all over the rest of the country. This is the price we pay for having 327 days of sunshine. <clears throat> I guess I'll take it. It's difficult to, to feel like it's fall, even though it's the end of October, even though the World Series is upon us. It's hard to feel like it's fall when it's a hundred and something degrees outside. So, good times, good times. Hey, let's talk about, um, you know what the show's about. Tuesdays, I'm here to prep a Dungeons & Dragons game. Wednesdays, I run that Dungeons & Dragons right here on Saving Throw Show. And on Thursdays, we come back and we talk about what happened, what were the consequences, what didn't go as planned, what could have gone better, what worked surprisingly well. So, uh, in between, I share with you my thoughts and methodology for prepping our game. So, <clears throat> today's Tuesday. It's time to, time to prep what's going on. Let's take a look at our agenda. It's our new overlay, everyone. Just because we're in the old space doesn't mean we can't have nice things. I'm talking to you, Shadzar. I know you're not logged in right now, but I'm talking to you. This is a nice thing. All right, so we're going to ping plot radar, sort of. I didn't set up the second camera. We're going to talk about handling a chase scene, because that's coming up right off the bat tomorrow. And finally, we're going to talk about converting and tweaking the final combat. So that's, uh, that's our agenda. If you have other questions, of course, you can kind of chip in as we go along. If you have suggestions, I heartily welcome them. And... Uh, it's, it's, it's loose, casual. I'm going to try and keep it to an hour. That's the plan. <clears throat> Michael Bay chase scene. There's not, there's not a very good reason why we couldn't have a Michael Bay chase scene. So. I will say, in all seriousness, let's put on our thinking caps and think outside the box on, despite the cliché, Let's be open to, okay, well, what would a Michael Bay chase scene look like in a D&D &D session? Because I think that's a valid and worthy exercise. I don't have my pen with me. <clears throat> Fired up, BSB Care. Where's that quote tweet? Quote tweet. Where are my, mar where are my markers? Where are my post-it notes? <clears throat> All right, let's just tickle some things in here. So, 
I'm not going to talk about what plot radar is. You can go back to last week's episode and see what plot radar is. So, uh, 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 uh. BSB Care has an idea that maybe there is a chase to the barrier peaks when we start that adventure. Yeah, that might be interesting. I honestly think... I don't think the players have a reason to, <clears throat> but I don't think they realize the importance of the map, that this is actually the map that gets them to the next piece of the campaign. They don't know. They don't care. And so I think, structurally, it would be more interesting if rather than a chase scene, an expedition has been sent there and gone in and gotten in trouble. Sort of an aliens style thing where, oh, somebody was here before us. Where are they now? Oh! I'm getting an ad on my stream, which is weird. Anyway. Um, who knows whether they care or not, but I certainly have not done any gr laid any groundwork that says you should know why this is so important or what have you. Uh, okay. Thought I had an audition. Nope. Great. <laughs> Thank you, phone. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it is a bit of a, a callback to being with, with Greg and Dell. Sure. No, I don't... But here's the thing. I don't think they're sent there to rescue those people. Right? That's different. But... I think you can use those... That party, that competing party, whoever it is, as a means of foreshadowing what's going on inside the complex at the Barrier Peaks. Right? So, it doesn't necessarily have to be a rescue mission per se. I just mean, it's like aliens in terms of they were sent there and and somebody else was already there who'd been, you know, um, attacked and taken hostage and exploited by the alien life, right? So I think we could have... It's not a rescue mission, but those people went in and they got destroyed. Well, let's figure out how we can avoid their fate. And, and you can use little vignettes of, here's what happened to these guys, to hint at, oh, well, these are problems that you're going to encounter, or maybe don't mess with this thing, or whatever it is. Why does it say we're hosting Henley? Is it anybody else? I'm gonna re refresh my stream. Somehow it swapped back to hosting Henley. Henley, I don't know what's going on. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, so those are those are some ideas that that like we'll 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 ponder further on that as we get closer to actually launching into expedition of the barrier peaks i expect there's going to have to be like at least one session of sort of set up like here's your mission go follow this thing with you know whatever so, something i don't think it's just going to end up being like oh and then this one ends and we go right into expedition of the barrier peaks so fine 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 that's great Let's get into our topics today. So I'm going to pull up, since I don't have the top-down camera, I'm going to pull up our plot radar, the photo that I took at the end of last session. Mm. All right, so let's just take a look at the things that are on the on plot radar here, on our last um, foray into plot radar and see if there's anything that moved. 
Now, they went to the Night and Shadow. I think we can largely retire the Night and Shadow. They have no reason to go back there. That would be great. They met Mort uh, Mortos in the Down Shadow. Okay, that, that happened. They have not yet met Thane, but they got uh, introduced to Thane. So, Thane needs to stay in our immediate column. <clears throat> the other stuff that we have in the approaching column also is going to start moving into the immediate column, right? So, our two, ostensibly our two people who are our villains, right? Talbot Restall, who I believe Talbot is the one who hi who hired Thane to start the to start the riot, right? He wanted to discredit Wintersteel and uh, and ruin his performance because Wintersteel took his was it Wintersteel? No, it was the other guy. Hmm. Tobias Marr, perhaps? Anyway. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. so Pavel Omble is the one who, who bought the poison. And I think, if I'm, if I'm recalling correctly, Talbot Restall is the one who wanted to discredit Fyrus Wintersteel because he was mad that he took his place. Let's just double check that. In our no, well, Pavel Omble poisoned Fire's Winter Steel of his own volition, <laughs> and Talbot Restall paid for the thugs to cause a riot and didn't know about the poisoning. <laughs> So it's kind of these two people working in concert to achieve the same thing, right? So Pavel Omble, as a member of the cult of Asmod Asmodeus, I don't know why, somebody said Asmodeus once to me and it's stuck. I like Asmodeus. Um, Pavel Omble, as a member of the cult, said, I want to get Talbot Restall into this show. So I'm going to po poison fire's winter steel. Talbot Restall also instigated a riot because he wanted to s support the cult. So both of these guys are cult members, and they're they're both sort of operating independently, which is a little bit weird, right? This plot line gets a little bizarre. <laughs> So, that's that. Those people are, and the cult of Asmo Asmodeus are all, and Rav and Dare are all going to move into our immediate column. They're coming up next. Gingy may or may not make an appearance. That's something that we need to think about. BSB Care has the thought that maybe the final ingredient needed for the potion of resurrection is somewhere within the barrier peaks. That would be an interesting bridge from one adventure to the other. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that came up that we need to drop onto our plot radar. Anything, any other element that got mentioned that we need to track. And I can't think of one off the top of my head. That doesn't mean I'm right. But in looking back at what we did, I can't think of anything else that really sticks out here, right? Is there anything that the players latched on to that was outside of our experience? I'm going to get my... My, oh, I have my folder here. I think I wrote a bunch of this stuff. Yeah, so the handy thing about having my NPC list on here, is I can go through and look at my list of NPCs and go, is there anybody that I care about? 
So, I don't think there really is. There's there's Ogren Iron Hands is that that the dwarf who apparently carved out some of the down shadow. He doesn't need to make that ghost. That ghost maybe needs the the ghost blessing, right? So I would put that on here as something that we could invoke again for Havana's benefit. Is the ghost blessing? Because she did, she did screw around with that statue. Other than that, the thugs don't need to come back. They talked to the prop master, Yahoo. They did an audition for the play. That's great. The stage manager hated them. That's fine. The barkeeps were barkeeps. And they met a couple of Marty and Morty, the two urchins. So that's that those are all of the things. So I think our plot radar is fairly complete. Alright. So let's talk about the closing scenes of our adventure. Where did I put my well, I thought I I thought I kept those I thought I kept those index cards in here so that I could plan out my here, here's a here's a plot radar right here everyone <clears throat> fancy I thought I kept the index cards in this folder with here in here but apparently not so <clears throat> We have, we have essentially two scenes left, right? Three scenes, if you really want to think about it, for the adventure as written. What's going on? So, our scenes are, they have 15 minutes to go meet up with Thane, this person who apparently arranged either the poisoning or the riot or whatever, right? Cool. They go and track her down. She spots them and starts and bolts and runs away. So we have a chase scene where they try and chase her down. If they succeed, they kind of corner her on the street and they can confront her in broad daylight, kind of off her game. If they decide to... If they fail in their quest to chase chase her down. They eventually do catch up to her, but she she retreats to her home territory and has all of these uh, minotaur thugs or whatever it's whatever they're they're called, whatever her gang is called around her. <clears throat> um, she has basically backup available to her. What does it say here? Blue Manticores, the Blue Manticore Street Gang. So, <clears throat> that's that's those are the stakes of that encounter. That's what's going on, right? So that's one encounter. Then we have an encounter where they talk to her and she gives them some information. As written, there's sort of a skill challenge to get the information from her. I don't know that a social skill challenge is as interesting as they thought it was back in 4th edition. It's certainly far less interesting when you have one person in the party who's got a plus 10 on all of their social roles, right? So, I don't know whether we'll make that an actual skill challenge. That's a mini scene, that's scene 2. And then they get the information to go to the Drunken Bard Theater and confront the conspirators and find out that they're all there and they're either lying in wait or they're not so there's essentially a large a big a big fight at the end at the drunken bar theater where they're breaking up this ritual that the cult of asmodeus is performing and then after that there's a q and a with some of the cultists and some of the other personages who are at this who are involved in this encounter 
and the players find out essentially what the what the what the <laughs> what the plot is. <laughs> I hate to be blunt about it, but that's essentially sort of what happens is at the big finish, they finally figure out uh, all the pieces finally come together in one place. A little bit, I think, a downfall of this adventure is things happen. The players don't know why they happen. They start chasing leads. They follow leads. They don't really gain any more information about what's ac what actually happened or what the motivation was, what was going on. So... Hopefully there's a lot of, um, um, hopefully Black Razor gets an opportunity to in, indulge in some delicious Asmodeus cult soul. That's what we're really looking for. Although, I don't know that Grayson is going to allow it. So, all right, that's, that's what we've got on the docket, right? Those are, the, those are the things that are there. I'm not too concerned about the interstitial scene of inter interrogating Fane. As I said, I'm not going to make this a skill challenge. I, I think they can do some basic intimidation to get some information out of her, but I'm going to handle that kind of on the fly. I don't feel like that's something that needs to be um, really worked up in any, any, any detail or add any significant flourishes to. However, as you can see from the agenda, we have two scenes left that I do think deserve a little bit of time and attention. So, the first thing is this chase scene. The hook, or the premise here, is that the party wants to talk to Fane, and she does not want to talk to them. So she bolts off and runs away. And there's a... In the, the adventure as written, there's a series of skill challenges, or there's a skill challenge that, that goes into effect where they have to chase her down and, and nav successfully navigate various scenes that interpose themselves in between, um, in between Fane and the party, right? So, let's just cover some of those briefly. I want to talk a little bit about the structure of this and how I want to handle this and the approach of implementing it into the game, right? So a couple of these are not particularly exciting. Is that okay? I don't know. We need to we need to think about that, right? But we're looking at rules as written. If a PC gets six successes, they have caught up to Fane and successfully chased her down. If they get three failures, they have fallen so far behind in the chase that they can't catch up within the idea of, uh, or, or within the context of this chase scene that's going on. And catch up afterwards, assuming somebody is successful. Once they get three failures, they're sort of out of it. So, the, the scenes that interpose themselves that constitute the skill challenge are as follows. I'm going to run through them all. I'm not planning to use them all. So, getting there quickly. Make an athletics check to kind of get a running head start. It's always weird. One, one part of this that's weird is these are largely, if you think about it, going to be either athletics or acrobatics checks. And yet, part of 4E adventure design was everybody has a chance to be good at this. And so there's also a diplomacy check, which is higher, but like you really egg on one of your teammates to do really well in the in the, in the check to to run really fast you provide them moral moral support you uh, you juice their morale right you cheerlead for them essentially I don't know I mean is it cool I struggle with that that piece of it right so I do like the idea that success gives a plus, plus two bonus. <clears throat> oh, to a reroll of an ally's failed check. So that's interesting. We're going to talk about the structure of this in a minute. Let me just run through these scenes. Uh, yeah, create cam. These are some interesting ideas. Like, like 
history of the town to, to know a secret ally or an insight check to uh, perceive what, to read her motives that she's going to try and knock something over or whatever. Save those ideas. Those are good ideas. Um, let, me, let me recap or at least briefly run through what these scenes are. So getting there quickly is one scene. That's that's before the chase even starts. Then they get there, and either she's she spots them well ahead of time if they failed their check, or she spots them uh, just in the nick of time if they made their if they they got if they were successful in their first challenge of getting there quickly. Okay. The next scene is. She teleports to the rooftop of the building and starts jumping from rooftop to rooftop. That's a cool scene. It's largely acrobatics and athletics. You can use a perception check to try to stay on the ground and keep track of her as you run. Um, as you as you run down, as she as she runs across the rooftops, you use perception to to navigate the easier city streets and keep track of where she is. Mm, I'll kind of buy off on it. That's fine. That's worth two successes. That's a lot right there. Blocking the street. So she throws some stuff in into the street, or she throws a dagger and snaps a rope and a bunch of barrels roll across or whatever, what have you. And again, it's either athletics or acrobatics to navigate through the tumbling barrels or what whatever it is. I do like the fact that they give some options, some suggestions, but they sort of leave it over, open to the DM to narrate the way that they want to narrate. So that's a nice touch here. Uh, lost in the crowd. In this scene, Fane runs into a local marketplace and hides in amid the bustling crowd. The marketplace is full of vendors. You have to spot her. It's really a perception check since there's no <clears throat> streetwise in 5e. All right. There's an optional scene where the city watch can get involved in this thing. So it's this is actually, it plays sort of against the PCs, which is... He's off duty. He sees the PCs running through the streets and goes, Hey, stop. You tell me what's going on. Who are you running from? Or whatever. Explain yourselves. I'm not a big... I'm not a big fan of this particular scene in terms of the chase scene because it really is a momentum killer. It really just drops all everything that's going on okay and then wait and then we hustle you know you want that feel of sort of this manic frenetic chase down the alleyways through the streets etc 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 and then when somebody stops and says well what are you doing buzz kill right so i'm glad that this is optional because i don't plan to incorporate it i don't think it's it doesn't have an interesting outcome right like, the only outcome on the, in this particular, for this particular scene is if you succeed, he goes, oh, okay, well, go about your business. But, but, it's, it's not a big enough payoff to make it worth the, okay, okay, now, well, now we have to stop and think of a garbage excuse that we can feed this guy, and then I'm going to make a roll and see if he buys it or not. It's just not a very interesting challenge. If it somehow he was like, oh, well, well, you know, you're investigating too? We've got that case open. And he begins to blow his whistle and the city watch starts to encircle. <clears throat> that would be an interesting outcome. That would be worth the time to stop. But I don't think... I don't think it's enough of an advantage to make it worth grinding the skill ladder, you know, kind of assault, climbing the ladder kind of thing, grinding that to a halt for a moment. I also don't think that the PCs right now in their current 
place in Waterdeep, I don't think Garav and Havana's characters want to get involved with the City Watch at all. They want to blow, like, oh, the City Watch, they've spotted us? No, like, that could be, like, a real oh shit moment for them, right? And I don't want to heighten this idea that, you know, the Watch is continually after them. It's been plausible enough that the Watch is like, you know, we heard something. They, 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 the Watch hasn't put things together. But to have them appear in this combat scene feels like really kind of like pushing the envelope a little bit of like, well, the, the, the watch is really hot out on your tail. So we'll skip that one. Uh, concerned citizens. So this is mildly interesting. I don't know. <clears throat> Fane convinces a group of friends that the party is trying to rob her and they stop, they essentially intercede, right? That's not bad. It's not, not, not a terrible, it's not a terrible scene. This does fulfill the role of you know, as Create Cam is pointing out, it's like we're trying to apparently trying to squeeze a charisma check into all of these physical checks, and that's that's probably true. And it's not bad design. I don't mean to poo-poo that. In this particular case, there's not as much of a downside as trying to convince the city watch that you're on the up and up, right? These are just normal citizens, and if you can make a simple roll and go, "No, me and my friends, she robbed us." Oh, okay. So I might be inclined to, you can dispose of it quickly, and I might be inclined to include this one to let Havana or one of our other more social characters have a moment to really shine in that particular way. Uh, there, there's a scene called Foul Stench, where they run next to the ta tannery, and the smell just is overwhelming. I don't know about that. I think I think that could be okay. I I don't what I don't like about this particular encounter is it's very short and a tannery is a very interesting place filled with a lot of weird, horrible, smelly stuff, right? And so I would want this I'd want to chase through the tannery to be more of a a, a, a bigger set of, of uh, skilled description type of stuff, right? So I'd want them to, like, I'd want to describe for them the vats of boiling hides and the chemicals and the smell, and, and maybe she gets up on a catwalk and runs across, and, you know, I just want a little more, ep I'd want to add something a little more epic to that location other than, oh, she, they, she runs through a tannery which smells bad. You're giving this very interesting location very short shrift, right? <coughs> Sorry, I got a little tickle in my throat here today. I don't know what the deal is. Now, that's the final scene. I think it's worth brainstorming just a few other ideas for things that could interpose themselves or things that she could encounter as she's running along here. Let me get my BSB care. It's your chance. It's your opportunity. I found them, everybody. Here are my cards. With the various encounters. A little too late. <clears throat> so, I think it's worth brainstorming just a couple other ideas for encounters, things that they could, they could see, or things that could happen that they could interact with, right? <clears throat> so, one thing that I think would be interesting is, like, let's really flesh out the cosmopolitan nature of Waterdeep 
And this is directly inspired by Storm King's Thunder, but let's have a giant of some sort walking down the street. Now, I'm not sure how this plays out, how it manifests itself, but I think it could be a couple things. You could just somehow like distract the giant or, or kind of try and fool him into thinking that the party or that Fane has somehow offended him and get him to stop or, you know, get him to like in, engage with her. Or maybe Fane approaches him or somehow does something to him that makes him, makes him angry and he just starts going berserk or he attacks the party. I'm not sure which way that to deploy that particular NPC. But I do know that it's going to be an interesting, it's an interesting moment, right? It's something out of the ordinary. Like, let's heighten the fantastic. Let's make it a little bit more of a epic game than it already is. Left Alt has a question. You may ask a question. Yes, buddy. Hello. Hello, buddy. While you're doing that, I'm going to scroll back and look at some of the other suggestions. That we had here. So Estelle Castillo says a religion check to know that what temple is having a parade down a major avenue. I like the idea of a religious parade. I'm not sure what that what that means or what that looks like, but I like that idea. <clears throat> I like the idea of doing some sort of check to get to a secret alley or <clears throat> navigate the streets. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I do think Estelle Castillo, I think, brings this up as somewhat... Mm, maybe somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I hope they smash through a plate glass window and crates full of chickens. Here's the thing. Those are incredible. That's incredibly cliche in a movie, right? It's cornball is all get out in a movie. It is a fantastic thing to play through as the players if the players have never played through that particular scene before. Oh yeah, and then and do I see two guys carrying a plate glass window? Oh yeah, they're walking across the street. Ah, perfect! You know, like, it's fun to have the players either engage, choose to engage or avoid that, that classic trope, right? It's almost like going into a cave and finding a dragon. Oh, you know, it, that's, that's, that's perhaps horribly tired, but the idea of fighting your way into a dragon's lair and defeating them is still cool and heroic. So don't dismiss those ideas as like, that's dumb or that's cheesy. Like, it's not fun to be forced to relive something that is a common stereotype. Or to pre or if it's something that like, oh, this is a mystery or a riddle that everybody knows the answer to, it's not fun to be forced to answer those things, right? Then it just seems tired and uninspired. But when it's an action sequence, yes, swinging from the candelabra, it is cliche. It's also cool. You get to you get to ride on the on the carnival ride yourself instead of sitting back and watching some actor do it on a safety of a set that you know you've seen this ten thousand times before and like ah oh, yeah they they broke the glass well you get to be the one who breaks the glass so that's fun right like don't I know it and maybe you meant it completely sincere but it I just read it as like well it could be tongue in cheek like oh this, these would be cheesy things. It, it's cheesy if it comes up too much, but it's it can be a fun way to change up the pace, uh, invite a little whimsy, and let the players choose to either avoid the plate glass window or not. Uh, and they have a skill challenge. You know, they have the challenge of like, okay, well, you're going to have to make an acrobatics check or an athletics check. You run up the side, side of the wagon and leap over it. 
It's also just a fun and harmless consequence. You broke a window. Okay. It's 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 a neat piece. It it, it fits within the genre, right? If you were going to play a, a vampire horror type of event for Halloween, and there's not, you know, a, a, a solitary red rose with, you know, horrible thorns on it or something like that, you're kind of like letting down the genre. If, if, the, if the vampire doesn't, like, approach the party with some sort of creepy overture in terms of, oh, I want to convert you to my kin or whatever, then you're not really doing your job. So it's just a, it's a brief aside on... It's easy to dismiss this stuff as, like, that's too corny, that's too stereotypical, but it's... Don't necessarily just out and out write it off before you go, would this be fun or not? And that's really what you got to do is sit down and go, would this be fun? Would my players enjoy this or not? Now, if you misread them, you're in trouble. Um, but that's how you learn to read them better, right? Making mistakes. So, that's my little brief aside on when we're, when we're brainstorming this sort of chase scene type of stuff, Let's really engage with it. Let's really think it over and, and not, just th not just throw away suggestions that seem trite or stereotypical. Sometimes those stereotypes work because they really are strong signposts and markers of the genre that we're exploring. Mm -mm -mm. So, left alt. Did you get to your question while I was uh, rant ranting? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the religious parade, like, it could be a parade of Torm, is kind of the straightforward... That's the straightforward, like, let Grayson have a moment to, to, to shine the spotlight on him. It could also be fun if it was some weird religion that, that maybe had some sort of bizarre thing where they're flagellating themselves with, you know, leather cords or chains or something like that. Or they're just engaging in some sort of bizarre ritual practice where they, they anoint people's faces with white paint or something like that. So, yeah, there's a, you know, uh, Shad Downer. Shad Downer? Shad Owner. Um, is, is a great thing that uh, has, has a great number of suggestions here with banner bearers and streamers on a wagon and somebody being carried around on a palanquin and a relic, le, reliquary on display where there's thieves who are working the crowd. Like, those are all terrific suggestions for you quick, like, paint, this, like, let's make it a little, let's give it a little moment of description, right? Um, let me write those down. Banner bearers. As Give Me an Axe points out, gamers love doing the stuff that they've seen in the movies. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> BSB Care says, what about something with a political rally for a Lord of Waterdeep? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, the thing is, like, the Lords of Waterdeep aren't elected, right? They're appointed. So... You could have a political rally protesting something. I like the idea of a religious rally, a religious parade, really. Like, that's a great suggestion. Shadowner. Shadowner? Shadowner. All right. Uh, well, left alt. Apparently, we never got to your question and never asked your question. I'm happy to address it if you... Uh, if you want to pop it into chat, so. Uh, a sword swallower. 
<clears throat> dodge or hurt the the person if you bump into them. Yeah, there, I think we could do something with. Maybe there's not just a. You run into the marketplace, right? There could be like a little carnival thing going on or a street performance, right? Like eating fire. Eating fire would be a good one, like a street performer who's eating fire. Or, you know, the classic taming a cobra or something like that. Yeah, there's a lot of different uh, religious factions all competing for your attention if you go down to Hollywood and Highland. So, yeah. That's, um, that's true. I wonder if it's not too much to try and describe all of those people as we're running through this scene. But I like the idea that maybe there's some sort of, like, apocalypse... apocalypse cult or preacher on the corner the end is nigh kind of guy and you can you can engage with them or you know shove them aside however you wish right but I could see you know three or four of those people like standing up with their placards and whatnot causing uh, causing and creating an obstacle so all right so those are some great suggestions <clears throat> I want to think think about which one you know do I want to incorporate all of those probably not but I like how this is far more brushed up now and far more do you see how just putting a moment of like let's create some unique opportunities that this is inherently a little more engaging and has more flavor than you're jumping across the rooftops I like jumping across the rooftops it is part of the genre it is something that is very interesting right it's it's one of those action movie things that the players like to do. Could we dress up jumping across the rooftops with someone is trying to land a griffin on this roof or something like that? So that's that's just some, something that you don't necessarily have time to deal with when you're running this as like an Adventurer's League type of thing. Is like, well, how do I... How do I dial us up just the next notch. But I think, since we have this opportunity, this is a great way to put inject some interesting life into this particular challenge. So let's talk briefly. Ugh, I'm gonna I'm, I might go over a little bit today, but we'll see what we can do. Yes, we did Michael Bay it up and we didn't have anything explode. I don't know what, but there's got to be something that explodes, right? We got to have like barrels of something. I'm just going to put barrels of explosion. It would be interesting if maybe there weren't necessarily fighting bots, but they 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 ran through, you know, they ran through a craps game that was going on, some sort of, like, back alley dice game. Or they ran through an illegal, like, boxing match that was going on in one of the back alleys. And maybe they have to either run around or run through the ring or something like that. Um, yeah, something to think about, right? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting the Michael Bay fantasies bent on this whole thing. So, uh... I want to just talk briefly about some of the thoughts that I had about how we implement this into the game. Initially, I was very tempted to get out a big roll of gaming paper and kind of either, either cut it up into pieces of the street so that we could use them almost as like geomorphic tiles and lay one down, and then you navigate this one and lay another one down, and 
really use that modular nature to give an idea that this is, chase goes on and on and on and on and on. And also to like show detailed pieces of like here's what's on the here's what's on in this part of the street and here's the building that's there and all that sort of stuff, right? <clears throat> Estelle Castillo says, What if a wizard was walking down the street holding his brand new necklace of fireballs? Oops, I dropped my necklace. Interesting thought. <clears throat> So, I thought about doing that, of really doing it as, as sort of a rolling grid combat. I like that idea on the one hand, right? And, and there's certain aspects of that idea that I really like. I like the idea that it would be this rolling chase that maybe you have one final tile that's like, okay, she got to her home base or whatever. You could have, I don't know, some sort of countdown on them or something like that. I like the idea that you might be able to like branch off and find your way onto a different street. Or I also like the depictive nature of it. If you could, you know, put a wagon on, put the people on, that sort of thing. So it has a certain appeal to it. I don't like, number one, the amount of time that would be invested in creating this prop. Now, it might be worth it because you could shelve it and use a geomorphic city streets for all kinds of different things. I did spend, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes looking online for something like this. I'm just looking for a battle map of a medieval city street. And there really aren't any. Because ideally, that's what I would do is just find one, print it off, there are a few, but it's a lot of work to cut them out and assemble them and that sort of thing. So, like, the the best option there would be, ideally, I'd just find a product, download it, print off 20 sheets of paper, and then cut them up into the tiles and have them fit together. But it doesn't really... It, that doesn't exist, and I don't want to invest the time to create it. We've got enough going on this week the way it is. <laughs> Um, I think the grid would translate well on the stream if we did our overhead view. You'd be able to see pretty well. And I want the characters to be able to use their miniatures, so I don't like denying them those opportunities. But, um, it's too much work, number one. Number two, here's my other big issue with this thing, is... As Estelle Castillo points out, Theater of the Mind has a lot of flexibility to it. And once you get it on the grid, it goes away from the part of your brain that's like, I'm running across the rooftops and I vault over to the next, and I just grab onto the rooftops and I slide down, but I grab the gutter, I pull myself up, and then I start running and I leap over the chimney. You know, that sort of dramatic visualization that happens in your brain all goes out the window when you put this stuff onto a battle map. Now it turns into, okay, I go, all right, hang on. I'm going six squares. I'm going to take a double move. Can I do an athletics check to go around the chimney, then go on the other side? You know, it turns into a math problem. And it turns into, you know, pathfinding your way to avoid a bunch of obstacles on the map. And it also turns into a lot of, okay, well, the thief can do dash as a bonus action, so they can move X number of tiles, and he can he's in heavy armor, so he only moves 25 feet, and he's like, I don't even know why I bother to move, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it takes the epic adventure element off the table and turns it into more of a chess piece moving type of strategy uh, style of play. And trust me, I think there's a place for that, but I don't think it pays off particularly well in this instant, right? Um, so I think we'll do this as a theater of the mind type of thing. I 
think it would be worth doing some sort of like abstracting the rules just a little bit where <clears throat> maybe we use some sort of pente stones or some other sort of token and we give Thane like 20 of these things and the PCs start with zero and each round that they score a success they get one or two and if they can take other actions that might hinder Fane, they would knock some off of hers. And whenever your pile reaches her pile, you've caught up to her, right? So that's, that's the sort of... Um, like, just a way to make the rules a little bit more abstract, but also still have a visual representation of what that success means. It also means that I can inflict conditions on the, or put challenges in front of the party that might cause them to lose some pente stones. Now you want to kind of balance that a little bit, right? Um, and make sure that they're actually going to be able to accomplish it if they don't completely fail out. But I think, you know, being able to get that little marker that says, oh, okay, this is one of my successes. Okay, I have six of them. Perfect. I mean, she has 12. Uh, let's see. We're going to have to find a way to knock her down a little bit more because I'm, I'm not far behind her. I could catch up. It, it, it lets you see this thing in a kind of a, you know, it gives you a more concrete visualization. All right. So we spent a lot of time talking about how this chase scene might be handled. One of the things I also considered was using the Pathfinder chase scene cards. I don't think I have them here. <clears throat> but I like the idea that these encounters could be put onto a card. And you flip, here's what happens next, flip them over. And maybe some of them are things where it's an opportunity to slow her down. And some of them are things, it's, a, it's an obstacle you have to overcome in order to score a success. Or it's an opportunity to boost yourself a little bit, find a shortcut. That's worth three successes. Boom, boom, boom. So you could definitely like make your own little chase deck and put the DCs on there and go, okay, here's the next challenge. You see this. Kind of makes it fresh for the DM as well, right? So that's that's my those are my design thoughts in terms of handling this chase scene. I feel like it's a big showcase encounter and I want to make sure that it gets its due and it feels fresh and interesting and exciting. We're going to kick off the stream with that, so <clears throat> I want to put a little work and a little polish into making it feel special and interesting and epic. Yeah, Pathfinder has a bunch of different uh, decks. There's a chase deck, there's a plot twist deck, there's a few other things. <clears throat> I had that, that, that something in my throat and I don't know what it is <clears throat> like I don't know if it's no. anyway can't blame the dog for everything <clears throat> so so let's talk about let's finally talk about this, this just for a few minutes let's talk about this final combat it's a little bit weird right So there's almost sort of a, a false start to this thing where they go in and there's somebody, some guy who's guarding the back and they got to kind of give a perfunctory like, oh yeah, we're supposed to be up there too. And then they make a roll and the guy goes, yeah, all right, or not, or whatever. <sighs> then they go upstairs And they find that on one side of this giant room, there's a stage where there's some sort of short play being performed. On the other side, there's a ritual that's being performed. You know, I want to put one other thing on our plot radar before I forget about it. We keep mentioning these broadsheets. It would be nice if they came across another broadsheet in the middle of the day that talked about kind of what the weird conspiracy theory is now and maybe gave them some insight into 
okay, well, here's what Roxy the Halfling, like, her take on what's going on. It doesn't have to be the full thing. It could just be a clipping or whatever, but it could also reinforce some of the stuff that we introduced. I'd like to see that broadsheet come back. It's also a lot of work in order to type up, you know, kind of three newspaper stories. But it would be really nice to have that drop in as, okay, well, the, you know, the morning edition of The Mocking Minstrel is out. Um, if you, uh, Estelle Castillo, you're talking about Plot Radar. So, so Tuesday's, last Tuesday's episode is good. Also, if you search my Dungeon Bastard account for Plot Radar, I mention it several times and give a couple different links to places on YouTube, specifically time-coded to, here's where I talk about Plot Radar and how it works. So search my, um, search, search my Twitter feed, my Dungeon Bastard Twitter feed. You know, it would be funny if the party during the chase ran into, like, a newsboy and this big stack of, like, broadsheets goes flying up into the air and hits one of them in the face. Whack. And, oh, here's in the latest issue of The Mocking Minstrel. I'm going to put that in as a potential encounter. Because I think it would be really an, an organic way to introduce that, plot, that prop. Assuming... I make it. Ha ha ha. All right. So, this is a weird combat. The ritual summons a demon. And some devils. Okay. Here's what I want, right? And there's there's also Ralvin Dare who is watching all of this stuff. I want this encounter to have some more weight to it. And I want it to have some dramatic weight to it. I think it's okay for it to be you walk in and everybody fights and whatnot, right? You can walk into this and basically a fight starts immediately. That's okay. I want this to have a little more dramatic weight to it in terms of maybe they are summoning devils to replace various actors in various productions. Maybe they are using the ritual to rewrite certain text or embed some sort of subliminal message into the play so that when when they rewrite the words of, of a text and, and the actors perform this thing, they're actually performing a ritual to Asmodeus, which, like kind of works on the audience in this kind of, like, brain, you know, uh, uh, brainwashing type of way. Those are the things that I think, you know, make this a little more high stakes than... Sometimes this stuff in Adventurers League hints at a larger storyline that's going on across the season so that when somebody plays four or five different adventures, they get this big sweeping picture of like, oh, I was involved in this huge plot arc. But we're, all, we're not running a huge s s uh, selection of these adventures. We're running one. And so we need to uh, uh, make this somehow more evident or heighten this particular aspect to it, right? Because this idea that the cult is trying to infiltrate theaters across the t across town is inherently interesting, but to what end? And I want it to be a little more dramatic than just 
because they want to normalize the idea of Asmodeus worship. Uh, I do like the idea about it in, in embedding them into the broadsheets. That really makes the reporter one of the villains. Which isn't a bad leap. Like, so then maybe they're in the basement of the drunken bard and they've got a printing operation going down there. That's not bad either. Um, although, I really think it's a... it's it, Because we have Robin Dare there, right? Who is the head of the Bards College. What if he's trying to get in this play festival, he's trying to get these texts introduced and also texts altered so that when they go across the city, they have this subliminal message attached to them. Because far more people are going to go see the play than are going to read The Mocking Minstrel. And if he can get the original text altered, then that's a ritual that sort of like lives on forever, right? And I, and I think it's also interesting to me that um, just on a real world note, I visited the Huntington Library this weekend and saw a first folio of Shakespeare. And the amazing thing about that is there are no original works of Shakespeare in existence. There's nothing in his hand you can't find anything that was contemporaneous with the performance of that play. The first folio was put together with players from his company, like writing down what they remember, you know, the way it's supposed to go, right? And I think that idea, if we transfer that into the fantasy world of like replacing a playwright's entire bodily, body of work with a slightly altered version for a nefarious purpose really is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so, so that's something that I think we need to introduce into this combat. Other than that, I think it's a matter of replacing a lot of the stats from 4E with, uh, a bunch of st stats from, from 5th edition. And trying to create a location that has some dynamic aspects to it, right? Because I don't think a room with a stage, there's some different levels there and whatnot. It, we've already had one fight on the stage, but we had a fight on a stage that wasn't particularly detailed, right? They swung down onto the stage and there wasn't any set dressing and it was could have basically been a blank slate, right? <clears throat> but if we draw the map out of this theater and as Give Me an Axe points out, you put a trap door on the floor, you draw in the places where there uh, are props and scenery, you describe, you know, in the wings where the fly gallery is, and there'd be things hanging above us, and things could fly in and fly out. There would be the orchestra pit where people could fall in, uh, all that sort of stuff. Now, all of a sudden, that is a combat environment that has different levels, has different elements that they can interact with. Maybe there's somebody down in the orchestra pit, you know, they that's where the cultists are conducting a ritual, and you just hear that noise. So, as BSB Care points out, we did already have a stage-slash-theater fight. That is true. But we did not fully utilize all of the location trappings and details of the theater. In fact, we utilized very few. There are footlights, obviously, that sort of stuff, right? I don't think the actual play is happening. I think they're rehearsing or it's set up for something, right? So let's get rid of the idea because we already had it of there's an audience there or whatever. 
it's the afternoon they're rehearsing or maybe they're rehearsing the show that they're going to open and there's nothing there right now and so now we can have some really interesting opportunities for maybe there's you know black powder poofs and effects that go off and that sort of thing right backstage of the theater while an actual play is going on going on on stage in front of in front of a crowd that's an interesting it's, it's a really great inter and interesting idea that could be a fun combat I, I like that idea I like both of these ideas right so whether it's an empty stage where we can really like go full destructo of like you know they 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 clamber up onto the fake pirate ship that's parked on the on the stage and they have a duel there all the way to we swing from the flag out we ride the scenery up into the flag gallery like that's that's a cool idea it's also a cool idea to try and have some sort of stealth combat going on backstage that they need to stop this ritual from happening without the audience out front knowing. I'm not sure which way I'm going to going to go with this particular idea, but I like both of those options. I think what it comes down to is we need to replace the setting for this, make it a little more epic in scope, make it a little more detailed and grounded in the specifics of this location. <clears throat> Because right now, even though it's the Drunken Bard Theater, this could be anywhere. It's really just a room with a fireplace and two different little antechambers off either side. Um, yeah, I do like the idea that maybe Grayson's on one side of the stage and, and the bad guy's on the other side of the stage and they have to come out on stage and have a sword fight. and integrate it into the acting. That, that, that's a very fun twist, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, Th those, are, those are all terrific suggestions. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I, think I, I think I largely have co-opted the globe. Although, so here's the thing, I don't think that this particular combat takes place the Globe Theater was a very particular style of thrust theater where there was a lot of audience around and it's not fitting in with my vision of a traditional proscenium arch theater. <coughs> not to get all technical on you, but I, I do have a BA in dramatic arts and dance. So, all right. Those are all fantastic ideas. I need to go off and ponder those and decide kind of which, which route I want to pursue here. Um, we may have an opportunity to kind of flip that switch on or off uh, based on donations. I don't know. That's an interesting idea is throw their fat in the, in the fire. The, the, the default easy difficulty is they have to fight in an empty theater. Maybe <clears throat> if the tip jar hits a certain level, they have to fight in a full theater while the performance is going on. I'll have to think about that. But uh, those are all fantastic, uh, <laughs> fantastic idea, ideas. So uh, BSB Care says, I just had an image in my head of it being a ballet instead of a play, and the characters have to dance around if they're on in front of the curtain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> A lot, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting opportunities here, and I want to just point out, like in the ten minutes we've been talking about it, we've come up with something that's far more interesting than what's in here is written. And I don't mean that to demean you know the people who wrote this particular adventure, because also they have four hours to deal with, and we're on session three of this adventure, right? We're literally going to be working on going into hour seven when we start tomorrow night's game, so. We get to embellish this all we want. That is, that is the luxury that we have of not playing this in a, trying to cram this into three and a half hours. So, so, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic session today. Thank you so much for 
all of your ideas. This really has uh, got me excited about tomorrow night's session where I was kind of like, I don't know what, how do I want to do this? I wasn't necessarily so so on it, but I wasn't finding what the spark was for these two encounters. And I really feel like we have chummed some inspiration into into the into the brain mill here and turn the crank enough times that we're going to be able to create some fantastic sausage yeah. so uh you know the other the other thing too is that this is written as an introductory adventure right so it's four character levels one to four and those things always softball you just a little bit and they're somewhat constrained in exactly what they can do so let's keep in mind that we're also playing this thing outside the scope of the intended level band, right? So, so we have some opportunities to do some weird stuff because the players have abilities that they just frankly wouldn't necessarily have in the adventure that this is uh, intended for, the, the level of adventurer that this is intended for. All right, so speaking of things that are going on this week, let's take a look at the calendar, shall we? I, I think at some point they're going to level up to six. I don't know that it will be at the end of tonight's adventure. The, th the final thing that we have not talked about is there's a huge wrinkle that will be the outcome of this entire adventure. And I don't think there's any way to get, a get away from this particular plot point. But somebody in that cult room is going to finger Jinji the Poisoner. I got it from this pale dude with steampunk goggles and a little weird bowler hat who made the most amazing... Like, he, he turned this stuff out overnight, practically. That's going to spawn... that Just that next boost. We're going to have to have some sort of dealing with Jinji session. I'm not sure what that looks like yet. We're not there yet. But I think after they deal with Jinji, that's when we pop a level. That feels like a natural milestone to me. Ordinarily, I would say, oh, they finished this adventure, that's a natural milestone. But this is such a major plot point that I don't think we can get away with not rewarding it in some form. And I think the most natural reward is to give them a, a level up at that point. All right. So there's a lot of there are a lot of things on the calendar this week, everybody. I hope you have been uh, tuning in and and plotting out your time appropriately because things are cooking over on the Saving Throw Show. So tonight we have Uncanny Valley with uh, Mr. Stephen Pope as your GM. There's a lot of a uh, lot of crazy hijinks <clears throat> on that show, our, our World of Darkness, uh, quote unquote, show. Tomorrow morning, uh, Mr. Domzook is back with proficiency check. I'm not sure exactly what uh, video game he will be tackling next, if he's going to be playing Duck Souls or not. But that's tomorrow at 11. Uh, at 8 o'clock, we'll be running Iron Keep Chronicles. You can join in uh, our game here that we've prepped and see how all of this stuff works out, just exactly uh, which elements I chose to incorporate and which ones actually like work well together and which ones didn't come together as we discussed. So uh, tune in for that on Thursday. Thursday night, uh, on, on Wednesday, Thursday at 2 o'clock, we'll have a very special episode of Disorganized Play. A very special episode. What do I mean by that? Normally we recap the show and talk about how it went. We might do that very briefly. But uh, America's GM... Hmm. No, she needs a better title than that. Um, the Queen of Butts is going to be joining us. Havana Mahoney, if you follow her on her channel, you'll know why I call her the Queen of Butts. Uh, the Queen of Butts will be joining me. We are going to talk about Brainstorm and Hack, her adventure for Extra Life. Our Extra Life Marathon starts Friday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, Havana is in the midnight slot from 12.30 to 4.30 a.m. She's going to be running a Scooby-Doo game, and I will be helping her uh, hack, modify, and otherwise uh, re-rig our Beastlings system that we used for our Session Zero of this campaign, and which is in itself a hack 
of John Harper's Wildlings. Uh, we'll be we'll be packing that into a Scooby Doo type of game. And so we're going to talk about some of the design decisions that go into reskinning that thing. Uh, I think we'll probably talk about some of the adventure elements and whatnot, and how that game might come together. So join me at two o'clock on Thursday with Havana Mahoney. We'll be back in the studio talking about her Scooby Doo game and how uh, how how that might come together, how the, that might work. <clears throat> so that is uh, super fun. Then, Friday night, it all starts with a very special episode of Wild Cards that kicks off our Extra Life Marathon. Uh, we're doing a Halloween-themed show. Uh, at midnight, as I said, is Scooby-Doo. Uh, Michael R. Holmes is running Justice League Dark with Evil Aquaman, Evil Aquaman 2, and Evil, Evil, Evil Aquaman... That's not true. He's I don't know who he's got in there. Whatever. Um, Garav is running from... I can't read the thing because it's too small. But Garav is running Strahd Must Die, a very special Ravenloft one-shot, one uh, uh, 5e one-shot, high level. Uh, that will feature Miss Amy Vorpal back on the channel on, on Saturday. So uh, tune in for those uh, good times, good times. Then at 2 o'clock, I will be running Tales uh, from the Loop which is essentially the Stranger Things RPG. I don't know. I did skip Crit, crit Juice because I'm a bad person. 8 o'clock tomorrow night is Crit Juice. Uh, or, or Thursday night is Crit Juice. So yes, thank you, Flockwad, for the reminder on that. The boys are coming in every week of Drinking and Dragons, so tune in for that. I'll be running Tales of the Loop. The whole marathon wraps up with a costume contest. So those are that is our Extra Life Marathon. We'll, uh, we'll get you a link to that sort of stuff. Sunday, it all comes back around with another installment of Tempting Fate with uh, Rick and Nick and his crew of <laughs> rabble-rousing players. So that is our agenda. we got a lot of great stuff on the calendar this week. And then next week, I'm at Game Con. I've got some fun stuff lined up in store for Game Con. I sent some files off to the prototype printer to get a couple decks of special cards made up and i have a couple other things that i need to send to my local copy shop so if you're coming to game hole con and you're going to be in my dm's workshop i've got some treats for you if you're going to be in my marvel superheroes game it's going to be a little different than you might expect so that'll be super fun thank you so much to Fawquad vsb care all of our regulars who uh, mod here on the channel keep Everything fun, clean, and friendly and accessible for our fans. Thank you so much to everyone who supports us, shares our videos and our channels on social media, whether it's our YouTube eh, or our Twitch. Eh. Uh, and thank you to everyone who backs our Patreon or otherwise puts a tip in the tip jar. We really do appreciate your time, treasure, and talent, whatever you can donate. Uh, it helps keep us going, just even just the encouragement of you watching along and giving your suggestions helps me run a better game. So, uh, thank you to one and all for being a supporter of our show, a fan of Save and Throw Show. Until tomorrow, let's dungeon! Oh, come on. Look, I'm, I'm back in the house for the first time. Mm -mm. All right. Zero for one. Zero for one.